Moving to Live is a podcast about movement and exercise. We bring you interviews with professionals in the movement and exercise field. The goal is to provide information for other professionals and also amateur movement aficionados, people who understand that movement is part of what makes life complete. Some of the people we interview you will have heard of. They're well known in and outside of the movement and exercise profession. Others you may not have heard of, but they have a great deal of knowledge to share. Many people doing the best work spend their time working with people, not working on their social media presence. We're going to give you a chance to learn from some of these talented and knowledgeable individuals, and we're going to learn along with you. Moving to Live podcasts are going to be short. Each interview will be long enough to impart usable information, but short enough to be able to be consumed in a single bout, during your workout, commute, or even during dinner prep. We all like long-form interviews, but time is valuable. Moving to Live wants to give you the option to learn and be entertained without needing to commit 60 minutes at a time for an interview. Give Moving to Live a listen. Check out our sister podcast, FitLab PGH, which highlights people, businesses, events, and activities in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area that make movement a priority. Moving to Live would love to hear from you. Want to connect with us or have an idea for somebody you think we ought to interview? Drop us an email, mov number 2 liv at gmail.com, or connect with us on Instagram and Twitter, both underscore mov number 2 liv. We're excited to bring you these interviews, and we think you'll enjoy each and every one that we bring you. Welcome back to another edition of Moving to Live. As you heard in the intro, we're a podcast about movement for exercise professionals and amateur aficionados. The key thing to remember is movement is part of what makes your life complete. Look at movement as a lifestyle and not just an activity. One of the main goals of this podcast is for me to be able to talk to people that I find interesting, but also to work to break down the knowledge silos so that people of different areas in the movement field talk about what they do so other people can learn about it. Because at the end of the day, the goal is to make people healthier. My guest tonight is the second time I've had him on. I told him before we started recording, I'm blaming him for dropping me down the (laughs) rabbit hole of physiologically monitoring again. I used a heart rate monitor up through the early 2000s, kind of got away from it. And after interviewing him about athletic performance and HRV, I've gone down the rabbit hole. When we finished the interview (laughs) back in April with Don Moxley, He's, he said when we finished recording, but we didn't have time to talk about recovery. Since then, he's had a slight job change, and it took a while to get it scheduled, but we're back tonight, and we're going to talk a little bit about recovery, or actually a fair amount about recovery, and also what he's currently doing, which is working as a scientist for a medical marijuana company in Florida. So we're going to get the opportunity to find out what is that all about and how it works as a supplement. So Don, thanks for taking time from your schedule to talk to me for, I guess, since we've interviewed you twice before, the third time. No, my pleasure. I love this stuff. And when we last talked to you, your main job is you were the sports scientist for Ohio State Wrestling. And we geeked out and talked about how all of the monitoring enabled you to do quite well and be able to predict the performance of wrestlers. I know from talking to you a little bit, you were looking for something else that maybe had some other opportunities. How did you fall into the uh, path or the ability to work for what you're doing now? If you could just kind of briefly describe what you're doing now. Yeah, it was the, the, re- the way I wound up with this job is um, I worked with a wearable technology company out in Albuquerque, New Mexico, several years ago. And while I was there, um, one of the really smart guys that was managing the, the, one of the managers there, he was a Stanford MBA, again, really smart guy. He and I both exited that, co- that, pro- that company about the same time. Um, we stayed in touch and he wound up going up into Oregon, got recruited, headhunted up into Oregon to work in the cannabis business. So he would send me notes like, so tell me about cannabis and HRV. And I, I started doing some research and I'm like, okay, this is legit. This is the, this is the real deal. And he would ask me questions about, so how, and I, I, I didn't quite have the detailed understanding, but what, what I did know is that there was only, there's only a few people in the country that were looking at HRV and recovery as intensely as I was. Um, NBA, NHL, Major League Baseball, and what we knew was there was some uh, 
pretty good professional athletes that would get stuck, either sympathetic or parasympathetic, and the traditional things would not move them out of this 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 level of stuckness. To use a good scientific word, and we um, may ha- we may have some listeners who didn't hear you talk about HRV in the first podcast. It's become quite popular. If you can give the little thirty second explanation of what is HRV. So HRV, what we're doing is we're measuring the time between heartbeats and the amount of time that that time between heartbeat varies. We measure the time between a minimum of 256 heartbeats that the more it varies, the more you're able to determine you're in what's called your recovery, your parasympathetic systems in control. The less it varies, like what, if you're sitting in a room and a bear walks in the room and you see a threat for your life, your HRV goes to very, very low, you know, eight or 10 milliseconds. And that tells your central nervous system, hey, we're in stress, start dumping cortisol, dump adrenaline, you know, let's, let's get the hell out of here. Um, uh, and, you know, typically, you know, we evolved to the point to where those stress events are typically short term events. Um, so, you know, you, you get away from the bear or you don't and you don't no one cares anymore. Um, <laughs> But if you get away from the bear, you want to go climb up into a tree and just kind of chill for a long time because that was a a major event. Um, Well, our challenge right now is that we create stress and we have a lot of paper bears. It's not necessarily real bears, but paper bears. So we're able to tell whether you're in sympathetic or parasympathetic, whether you're moving in between based on your HRV. So it's kind of like a tachometer in a car. Um, So... um, so what we found is that some of these pro athletes were getting stuck, either dominant parasympathetic or dominant sympathetic, and they weren't cycling. And they would go out on a weekend bender, and we everyone knew what they were doing, and they came back fixed. Um, so so we knew that we had some anecdotal evidence that said that we didn't have that with my with my wrestlers, but again, just knowing the people I know and the conversations we had, we had some interesting conversations. And then you take a look at traumatized, uh, traumatized populations. You know, there's a reason why Vietnam vets smoke more pot than other people. Um, they had their own rather extensive level of trauma. And so we, which is a sympathetic controller. Um, and so we knew this was going on. So, you know, my, my future there at Ohio State, I'd pretty much run it out that I, I didn't have a few, I didn't really didn't have a good long future there anymore. We knew that. And when my buddy called me, he had moved into the position of the COO of uh, one of the large uh, cannabis investment groups in North America. And um, he said, he said, Hey, you want to move to Florida? And I said, this looks like a really cool opportunity. And I, I took it. Um, you know, that, uh, I, you know, my wife and my daughter and I sat down and said, what do we think about this? And I, you know, it's a, it was a major change of life, but, um, but it was one that we were ready to take. So I took it. Now I live down in, uh, the Palm beach area of Florida. And when you talk about the cannabis industry, you're talking about the medical marijuana industry. Yeah. In Florida, it is a medical industry. So there are currently 12 companies that are licensed to produce, uh, to grow cannabis, to extract the oils that are in it, to put it into consumable modalities, and then turn around and sell it to customers that have been. And our customers have had to be licensed, meaning they've had to go to a licensed physician who has been qualified to write medical marijuana recommendations. And um, once they have their license from the state of Florida, they're allowed to purchase our products based on the recommendations of their physicians. And I'm curious, I know this is a topic that's somewhat controversial, medical marijuana or marijuana in general, but I think it's great to be able to talk about it. Did you have any doubts or qualms when you first started looking into it? It's like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this. Or was this kind of like, hey, this is a new adventure. This is interesting. This is something that's changing and I want to be a part of it. Well, I I knew I certainly wanted to be a part of it. And I've never really had a problem. I've never had a problem with the consumption of cannabis or people who want to consume cannabis. Um, you know, cannabis is an intoxicant. Um, you know, listen, choose your, well, first of all, alcohol is a neuro, is a neurotoxin. 
So when you become intoxicated using alcohol, you're damaging your nervous system, you're damaging your liver. When you use cannabis as an intoxicant, it's a neuroprotectant, okay? No one wakes up from being stoned feeling hungover, okay? It's, there's a lot that goes into this. So, I, I, listen, I'm not a judgy person, you know? If you want to smoke some dope, smoke some dope, you know? Um, and, and I've kind of grown up that way. It's been part, you know, I, again, it's not for me to decide, but when we had the opportunity to look at this from a scientific standpoint and really get into it, it's an amazing, it is an amazing plant that can do amazing things that one of my jobs is to connect our brand to physicians that, that write recommendations. And I am in doctor's offices every week and I see incredibly ill people looking for relief. And I see them get relief through the consumption of cannabis products. Um, we alleviate suffering. And we alleviate suffering in a manner for people that they're not able to alleviate any other way. Um, if they could have done it through the traditional medical system, they would have done it. Um, but they've not been able to. And, um, and then so we alleviate suffering. And then there's this great saying that talks about the betterment of well people. When you take a look at well people, you know, as we move into this in this presentation, I'm going to talk about this concept where there, there's there there's 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 a there's a lot of logic to the to the idea that perhaps exogenous cannabinoids should be looked at perhaps as a vitamin. Um, that the regular consumption of these, um, and and we can talk about why that is, but there's a really good researcher from over in England. His name's Ethan Russo. He proposed this concept of a chronic anandamide deficiency. Anandamide, that is an endocannabinoid. That is a cannabinoid that your body produces. Um, it's one of the powerful ones. And um, when you look at cannabinoids, these cannabinoids are, communi are human communication tools that when you are born and you're nursing on your mother's milk, it is loaded with anandamide because it modulates neural behaviors, neural modulation. Um, what, the conception, the conception of the egg implanting in a uterus requires endocannabinoids, requires anandamide. Um, so from a nervous system standpoint, this is a very critical chemical. Well, uh, again, we can talk about why that is, but, um, but when you look at it, there, it looks like we may need, some people may need to ingest exogenous cannabinoids on a daily basis in order to mediate some of the nervous system's uh, uh, conditions that lead to pain that lead to anxiety, that lead to a lot of the conditions that are being, that are being treated with cannabinoids. And um, like I said, there's a reason to look at, at exogenous cannabinoids more like a vitamin rather than a medicine. And I know that there are a number of states that have legalized uh, medical marijuana, and it is still technically illegal federally. I'm curious why medical marijuana versus what you see out there, CBD oils that do not have uh, THC in them? Is there an advantage, a disadvantage? Is there an advantage or are you able to talk about uh, CBD yeah. oil? So CBD, so CBD is cannabidiol. It is a cannabinoid. It's an exogenous cannabinoid that's produced by a plant. So the two dominant uh, cannabinoids that are produced by a cannabis plant are THC, tetrahydrocannabidiol, and cannabidiol. Um, CBD. Now, the challenge, so they both work. They both bind to the CB1 and the CB2 receptors in your central nervous system. Um, they both provide relief. Now, the challenges with the, one, of the, one of the things that we have found is that when you get CBD oil from cannabis, which is not hemp, hemp is a cannabis plant with less than 0.3% THC. So um, it's, it's a, it is, you could get THC from it, but it's a plant that's been bred. So there's less of the THC. Is that? Well, yeah, it's not been bred for THC. It's not that the THC has been bred out. It's just, it's not been bred for THC. So it's just um, a variety, it's a variety of, of the plant that is low in THC. Exactly. 
So now, would, it, would it be correct for people who aren't listening, similar to maybe some type of lettuce that wasn't bitter because that's just the way it was? Or is that yeah, oversimplifying I, it? No, I listen, um, you know, I, we talk, one of the challenges we have in this industry is that um, if you think about, if you go get a, a tomato off of your tomato plant and you dry it out and you take the seeds and you take all those seeds the next year and you plant them in a row and you have plants that come up from those seeds. Now, they're all genetically identical. Um, but based on, the pheno- based on the environment, you're going to have a different phenotypic expression from those seeds. So not all the tomatoes from the plants that came from the same tomato are going to be exactly the same. So there's, there's variation depending on where they are in the row, what kind of light hits them. There's just a lot of variation. And that exists in cannabis as well. Um, so there's variation in that, but the CBD, the challenge with the CBD that people see in the marketplace is twofold. Um, number one, most of the CBD that is sold in this country that does not come from a licensed grower comes from China. Okay. And there are no, currently most states do not regulate the growth and processing of CBD from hemp. Now, Colorado does, Ohio's starting to look at it. But one of the challenges is the hemp plant or the cannabis plant are, is a very powerful phytoremediation plant, meaning that, you know, you can plant this stuff on a brown site, on a, on a, on a, on a you know, a poison site, and that plant's going to pull all those heavy metals and all those things up into it. And if you're not paying attention to where it comes from, that may be what you're consuming. So, now, so similar to some large cities where they recommend if you're going to garden, do it in a container garden where you use yeah. your own soil rather than your backyard. Yeah, and, and, and cannabis is particularly good at really pulling stuff out of the soil. It's, 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 it's very powerful. So if you're consuming CBD, first of all, if you're consuming CBD, you probably, you probably have already thought to yourself, oh, this makes sense. I've gone ahead and bought the product. Um, now the question is, are you, are you buying something that has any CBD in it or is it just oil that someone has, you know, cause if there's no testing and there's no chain of command, you don't know where it's coming from. Um, we don't have the ability to do that. We have to regulate everything we do from seed to sale. Um, so, and you, you know, and you were saying before you started recording to the, ex- before we started recording to the extent that there are mother CBD or mother, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of it. Yeah. Other plants that you take in essence, saplings off to grow the actual plants where you harvest the seeds from. Yeah. No, well, we don't do seeds. Um, so most of the, most of the cannabis industry is, is, um, the Jamaican term is ganja. That is, uh, the mother plant. So we don't have seeds or sensimian. Um, you've probably heard that term. Um, that's also dealing with mother plants. So we take our moms, we clone. So we take clone cuttings off our moms they go into a, a little uh, a rooting bed, and they are numbered at that time. Um, and every one of those clones gets tracked. If it dies, it gets tracked. But if it goes through production, we see that plant, and we have a record of where it's gone through, when, when it is dried, how it is extracted. Once the oils are extracted, those are tracked in our system. And this keeps flowing through until we actually deliver the product to our customer, which we are required to do testing. So we test for not just percentages of the cannabinoids or the terpenes or the other you know, parts of the plant, but we test for molds and funguses and pesticides and heavy metals. Um, our particular company tests for more than anybody else because you know, our, our brand is about the best product available. We've got a we've got a great grower. I've got a lab director that's a freaking genius, and um, and uh, so we have a chain of command that's tested through and through. Um, so that's that's reason if you're going to try CBD, you need to pay attention to where it's coming from, and someone should be able to show you lab reports. Um, if they can't, they probably don't have them, so you don't know what the source is. But you know, Tennessee has laws on this. Colorado has laws on this. You should be asking about where your CBD comes from. And I know I use CBD oil um, and it comes from Colorado and there's actually a lab report that you can download from the website, which I've noticed differs from batch of oil that I order to batch of oil that I order. Absolutely. Just like the, the tomatoes, it changes. Now, 
the the reason so you're getting it from Colorado and this hemp based CBD because it's federally illegal to ship cannabis based CBD across state lines. Correct. Um, but if you have if you live in a state where you have access to cannabis based CBD. There is something that happens when you have a lot of CBD with a very little amount of THC, and it's called the entourage effect. And this entourage effect is measurable, it's predictable. So you have access to CBD products from cannabis, and you can get it. That's a superior product. We're doing some. We're doing a little bit of testing on this to try and figure out, you know, just how. Um, how significant it is, but it is significant. It does make a difference. So there's something with having a small amount of THC that accentuates the benefits of the CBD. Absolutely. Yeah. Entourage is the real fact. And, and there's a lot of research. Everyone talks about the fact that there's no research on this. Well, there's no research in this country. Um, but our, our government has been funding research in Israel and in Holland since the 60s. There's over 28,000 articles in, um, in PubMed on cannabis and marijuana, and most of those studies have been contributed or, or funded by our federal government. And while our federal government says that cannabis is a Schedule Five drug, which means there's no medical value, our government also, the Department of Health and Human Services, also owns a patent on using cannabidiol and cannabis as an anti-inflammatory. Um, so while one side, one hand is saying, "Hey, there's no value," the other is saying, "Well, there's enough value that we're going to go ahead and pull a pull a um, a patent on that." So you know, it's, there's some bullshit that goes on. So you mentioned a couple of minutes ago that uh, cannabis plants are really good at pulling things out of the soil. Is that the reason why uh, most medical marijuana places, if that's the correct terminology, when they grow, they grow indoors? Because it reduces the risk, or is there more control over the agriculture by growing it indoors? Growing indoors, there's a lot of control over the over the over the environment, and there's also you have to pay attention to with you know most of the medicine that comes out of a cannabis plant comes out of the flower, and that flower only happens during certain solar phases, um, so it's easier to con- control the light phases on a plant indoor than outdoor. Now, down here in Florida, we've got – Florida is full of freaking bugs, man. Um, that's, that's part of what comes with, uh, with the tropics. So it's, it's a lot easier for us to control bugs um, in, a, in a closed environment. Now, we're getting ready. You know, we're building out our closed environment, but we're going to need more production. So we're probably going to go to an outdoor grow at some point in time. Um, but we're not going to be growing our best products outdoor. You know, the, the stuff, you know, it's going to be kind of the mass produced stuff's going to be outdoors and our quality stuff's going to be indoors. Um, but that's just, that's just growing a business. I'm curious with a, a mother plant, how long from the time that uh, a seedling or a clone is taken off the mother plant, how much time does it take until it's actually harvested and able to be sold? It's between six and nine months. So it's a long-term process. Yeah, it's, um, well, yeah, it's um, when, when we, when we're, yeah, it's about six to nine months, depending on the variety, depending on, you know, there's, there's a lot of dependencies that go into this. Some of these flower faster than others. Um, but, you know, when, when we're, when we're doing our projections, six months, when we're getting the six month turnaround, we're doing really freaking good. And I think I know the answer to this, but I think it's something that's good to get out there. Why are there different varieties of the plant? Why not have the same variety of plant? Well, there's arguments for both. But, you know, when you go to the store, you can buy Fuji apples and Gala apples and Macintosh apples. You know, why not just have one apple? Well, different varieties produce different characteristics and particularly in our area produce different chemovores. So there are medicines that are real CBD dominant. You know, if you've watched any of Sanjay Gupta's weed series, Weed 1, 2, 3, 4, the Weed 1 is about this uh, chemovore called Charlotte's Web, which is a CBD dominant, um, which is a CBD dominant variety. Then there are what's called sativa and indica varieties. So an indica is very much, um, we talk about it puts you in the couch. Um, it really locks you down when you use it, whereas the sativa, a lot of times, will be referred to as the housewife's friend. It's a stimulant. You get a little bit of a head high going, and you get energized. And um, so as we move across the entire cannabis world, 
there are different genetics, the same way there's different genetics in apples or any other, you know, agricultural product. And I know, as you mentioned a few minutes ago, that even though you're growing something from a plant, there's going to be slight differences just because you're not, you can't control everything and the, the light, et cetera. Is there a certain, I'm trying to come up with the right word, a certain range that a specific variety has to be in with various uh, cannabinoids? Or is there some of the, sometimes when you grow a plant, do you test it and realize, yeah, this isn't good enough, we have to destroy it? You know, you're now moving into an area, you're moving deep enough into an area that is not in my wheelhouse that I'm going to back away from. So I'm a human performance guy that is looking at the application of the extractions to the human. Okay. Um, I'm a guy that if a plant is real, it dies in my house. Okay. Um, so I don't, I don't grow well. But we have really good people. Our our uh, head grower is a guy by the name of Darren Potter, and he's an, he's actually a native Floridian that uh, made his way through California and Colorado, and along the way won seven cannabis cups and twenty seven different awards. And this guy can freaking grow plants. Um, so I let him work his magic, and we've got a lab guy by the name of Ethan Borg who did his graduate work at the University of Amsterdam that runs a lab that is just. The, the product that he has come out of our out of our processes is just beautiful and impressive and as consistent as you can get. And then I work, you know, the tail end of this trying to um, help our company connect to physicians. And we're spending a lot of time educating as well. We've got a lot of docs that are trying to figure out how does this work? So that's that's kind of where I really come into play is understanding this and and helping build knowledge in the medical practice about how to effectively use these products. It sounds like you're confident enough to say you're not always the smartest man in the room. Oh no, we've got some really <laughs> smart people. This is that's a, you know when I came down and interviewed when I you know back in in April and May when I was looking at this you know, I, I, I'm getting ready to make a big change in my life. And, and, and while I had a friend in the industry and Carlos, I still, you know, I'm moving into this new company and I moved down here and I met Darren and I thought this dude is smart. Um, and I saw his work and I thought, okay, I'm, that's someone I can partner with. And I was excited about it. So we're going to get into a little bit about the performance, but I, I know you can talk about this because you go to physicians there's a lot of misinformation out there in what people call blog clog. You know, anybody's an expert. <laughs> Why would a physician want to prescribe marijuana? What's it, or what's it, what's it used for? What are some of the things? I realize you can't go into everything because we'd have a five hour or 10 hour podcast. Yeah. The, so when you go look at the research, um, there has been quality research done on utilization of cannabis products of some kind on up to 47 different conditions, medical conditions. Now, when the people use cannabis, nearly 95% of the recommendations of cannabis are for pain and pain-related pain um, uh, characteristics. Now, when you're dealing with pain, ultimately, you have to deal with sleep, you have to deal with anxiety, and you have to deal with pain. Um, so the product is particularly good at in, in those areas, and we can talk about why that is the case. But it goes across the board. The other, you know, when you look at uh, relieving spasticity and muscular dystrophy, when you take a look at its application and use in um, migraine headaches, when you take a look at uh, irritable bowel syndrome, and um, when you look at the communication between the nervous system and the bowels and the endocannabinoid system, it looks like this endocannabinoid system is a critical tool in understanding how, where is this condition coming from and how is it um, being modulated. Um, so again, over 47 different conditions, you know, the national science foundation has a great guide out there that you can find online on cannabis and cannabinoids where they've gone back and done research and said, you know, where, what is good, what is average, what is bad, you know, not everything they say it works for has research supporting that. But the National Science Foundation is really clear. There is a substantial amount of research that supports the use of cannabis and cannabis products for the treatment of pain. And from what you said a few minutes ago, depending on the variety of cannabis is going to depend if it's something that acts as a something that will maybe, for lack of a better term, pep you up or depress you. Yeah, depending. So when we when we grow the plant, not only do we extract 
cannabinoids, but we also extract something called terpenes. So a terpene is something most people are familiar with in aromatherapy. So when I go to bed at night, I have an atomizer in my room that I put um, uh, an oil into that it smells like lilac. Um, well, it has a terpene called linalol. Linalol is a relaxing uh, terpene. Um, hops is a first cousin to cannabis uh, genetically. And so if you like to drink very hoppy beers, um, a lot of those very hoppy beers, when you wake up the next day, they've taken a toll on you. You're paying a price. It's not just the alcohol. But why would one alcohol be different than the other? Well, there's another terpene that's called myrcene. Myrcene, you find it very dominant in mangoes. Myrcene is a very indica-creating terpene. So I've, I've heard it described where, where the cannabinoids are the engine in the car, the terpenes are the steering wheel. So depending on the effect that you're looking for, so a change in terpene profiles uh, will modify that cannabis effect. So, you know, I had a brother, my brother was dealing with some pain and he got some, he got some CBD oil that came out of Colorado. A friend gave it to him and he said it was really disturbing his sleep. Well, I told him, I had him read me the label. So we know that lemon is an energizing scent. Well, there is a terpene called lemonine. Whenever you smell it, you're smelling lemonine. Well, lemonine is energizing. It's a sativa. It has a sativa impact. Um, so all I had to do is have my brother stop taking it before bed, start taking it in the morning when he wakes up, take it at noon so he can get his CBD levels up. And, that, and, and we're not getting the lemon energizing effect right before he goes to bed. Two additional questions I have that this all brings up is, first of all, some people who are listening to this may be, may be saying, well, I don't want to smoke anything. What are the various ways that your company sells the product? Well, and, and frankly, I think smoking is the worst way to consume it. Um, now, what's interesting in the adult use rec community, people who like to smoke dope, okay, it's very wine in nature, whether it's a Merlot or a Cabernet. When you start to look at these strains, when you look at people who really get into this, they love that taste and feel and effect. They love, and I'm not a cigar guy either. OK, but I know but I know people who like cigars and I know why they like cigars. Well, uh, so smoking cannabis can can give you that effect. Um, I tend to be on the other end of the continuum. I tend to be on the very CBD dominant with a little bit of THC. And so it can. Be, so when we, we extract the cannabis, the, the cannabinoids and the terpenes as oils and those oils, be they, they essentially wind up. It's, it's what's called hash oil many times, but we extract those oils and we refine them. So these can be consumed either in a trans, uh, translingual, what's called a tincture. So those cannabinoids and those terpenes are crossing your, the buckle in your mouth. You can use them transdermally. You can vape them. Um, if it's produced correctly, you can inhale them. So the inhalant is the fastest way into your system, vaping, and there's no carcinogen at that point. Um, one of the challenges with smoking is that you, you're burning a product which creates a carcinogen. If you're using cannabis, you're probably inhaling deeper and you're holding it longer than what the typical tobacco smoker does. So there's probably, you know, when you look at, at using cannabis in a smoked form, there's probably as big a risk for lung cancer with that as there is with tobacco. Um, but you can, you, can, you can miss all that using the extracted products. Again, translingual, transdermal, um, uh, there's a lot of ways you can do it. If, if you're using an edible, an edible works for THC. An edible is not a good choice for CBD. Um, the, liver, the liver metabolizes um, the CBD and lowers the bioavailability, whereas the liver increases the impact of THC. So if you, it's uh, if basically when if, if you consume a, a, a milligram of THC uh, smoking or vaping, uh, when you consume that orally and it has a chance to go through the liver, it increases the impact of it by about five times. That's why people get in such big trouble with with edibles. Um, it that it converts it and you really get pounded. And I know this is a quite new field in the United States. Who decides on the dosage? How is that determined? That listen, that's the that is the that's the unicorn right now. 
um, that there's, there's not only is there variations in the genetics of the plants, but there's variations in the genetics of the human. Um, the same way humans will have different, um, let's say, insulin receptor affinity uh, for someone who is a type 2 diabetic versus someone who's not, uh, that's an insulin receptor. Well, the cannabinoid, the, CB, the CB receptors, the cannabinoid receptors can also have different affinities as well. So, um, so you very much have to ap- approach this plant from a, um, a, a nutraceutical manner rather than a pharmaceutical manner. Pharmaceuticals are about isolating a molecule, being able to purify the response and be able to dose very effectively. Um, when you're using cannabinoids, particularly like if you're using it for glaucoma, glaucoma is a very THC dominant treatment uh, process. And in fact, you probably need to eliminate CBD from the glaucoma use because it looks like CBD may be, may be interfering with the, the THC in treating glaucoma. Um, most other m- medical conditions uh, usually start with a base of CBD and you add just that, you know, I, I, I talk about with pain, you want to get your CBD levels up and then you find the Goldilocks level of THC, not too low, not too high, just that right level. And that typically is part of the pain treatment protocol. So when you're dealing with the THC, you use a term, it's what's called you start low and you go slow and you continue to meter it up until you, you find relief. We're talking with Don Moxley. Don, I've realized we've talked for about 25 minutes and I haven't uh, asked you specifically, what's the company you work for? And I want to give you the opportunity since they're allowing you to talk. I work for a company in Florida called Grow Healthy, um, and we are part, we're owned by a company called Ianthus. So you can find us on the Canadian Exchange. And we were talking, I think this was a little bit earlier in the recording, You were, and you said this a few minutes ago also, you should look at uh, cannabis as being a nutraceutical and not a pharmaceutical. Mm-hmm. And I think that's going to play very well into our second part of our conversation of recovery maybe quickly define what's the difference between a nutraceutical and a pharmaceutical and then expand a little bit more on why CBD and cannabis is better as a nutraceutical rather than a pharmaceutical. Well, I don't know that it's better, but you have to view it that way. I was at a conference about two weeks ago and I was sitting next to this great doc from over in St. Petersburg. She's a pain management doc. And and one of the challenges with pharmaceuticals is the business model. It's about, it's about patenting the molecule and, and living through that patent. And that's starting to happen in cannabis that, uh, there's a company out of Britain called GW Pharmaceutical that just got a CBD product through FDA clearance. In fact, uh, they, the, the federal government, the DEA has basically reclassified any CBD medicine that has been approved by the FDA as Schedule Five. Um, this just happened within the last within the last month. Um, so you have all the games that go on at that level, but it's very difficult to patent a plant. Um, so so this is again, you know, uh, uh, you can patent uh, Roundup Ready soybeans and corn because of the genetics. Um, so there's a huge effort going on in cannabis to publish the genetics and get them out there. There's some really cool sites that are doing a nice job here, but you have to approach this as, as a nutraceutical, um, because you're dealing with a plant, not necessarily an isolated molecule. And you have a good definition for what a nutraceutical is for people who don't know? No. <laughs> we'll make sure we'll put a definition to okay. nutraceutical in, in the in the show notes yeah so one of the reasons i wanted to have you back on the podcast and i think this segues very nicely into it is you did a great job the last time we talked to you talking about all the data you were collecting on ohio state wrestlers and i think the number that's stuck in my mind as far as monitoring performance etc was over seven million data points uh, three and a half we had three and a half million data points in a year but that's so, okay so, so I doubled it for you. I've, I've been giving you extra credit with everybody I've been talking to. That's, that's right. The farther you get away from the story, the bigger it gets. It's like fishing. So we, we, had, uh, we finished up, but we didn't have a chance to talk about recovery, although in the podcast you talked about a wrestler who you were able to convince the coach to actually decrease his training, which seemed because he wasn't performing well, which for anybody who knows most coaches and most athletic performance, if an athlete isn't doing well, well, obviously it's because they're not working hard enough. We need to work them harder. And you had the data points to show it wasn't. 
but we haven't really talked that much about the recovery aspect of athletic performance. And I think that plays in very well with uh, your position in cannabis. So why is recovery for athletes so important? Well, so the reason it was important, the re- so recovery for athletes is important when athletes are not recovering. Okay. So, you know, not to make, you know, a completely stupid statement, um, you know, part of the challenge is, is figuring out what is the element. So, you know, if, if we take a piece of paper and we draw a line on it, you know, from horizontally from left to right, and w- we call that line homeostasis. Um, that's where your body likes to stay. It wants to stay in homeostasis. Well, if on the top of the left-hand side of that line, you draw a box, and the height of the box is the intensity of the training event, and the width of the box is the duration, and what you put in that box is the modality, okay? That is introducing hormesis into homeostasis. We're, in, we're, we're introducing a stress that the body wants to respond to. Now, when we introduce that stress, again, we talked about it earlier in the podcast. If a bear walks in the room or a tiger or a lion walks in the room, you immediately go into sympathetic. You, you become sympathetic. Your body's like, holy mackerel, get out of here. Um, and in order to do that, your heart rate variability, the, the heart rate variability goes to very, very low because it's your, your very sympathetic dominant, which causes your adrenal glands to dr- dump cortisol and to dump adrenaline. And your body is all about, let's you get all the resources that you need to get out of here. Okay. Now, if you get away, great. If you don't, your lunch, okay, we don't care about you anymore. You don't get to send your genetics anymore. But if you do get away, you have to begin a process of recovery um, because we have to shift the hormones. So where we go from dumping cortisol and adrenaline and noradrenaline and so forth, we want to get to where our, our gonads are producing testosterone, we're getting nitric acid, we're getting IGF, we're getting the, the recovery hormones that give us the chance to build. Um, so that's essentially the process that you want to mediate, sympathetic to parasympathetic, sympathetic to parasympathetic. And for athletes, we want to bring them into competition because when I'm very parasympathetic, I'm using resources to recover. When I go into competition, I don't want to be using resources for either recovery or I, I want all my resources available to me. Um, so that's where the timing comes into play. Now, what's been just an amazing, what's been an amazing uh, discovery for me, and, it, and I knew something was here, but I didn't, I didn't quite understand it. But when I got into the industry, what I learned about was this horm, was this, uh, what's called an endocannabinoid. It's a cannabinoid that your body produces that's called anandamide. So anandamide was first discovered back in the early days. We didn't know much about it, but it was part of discovering what's called the endocannabinoid system. And the reason a lot of physicians have a problem with cannabis as a medicine is that the endocannabinoid system was really discovered and understood in the 90s. So unless you're a young physician, you didn't learn about it in medical school. Um, So when I started to look at anandamide, I found out that, wow, what an amazing, it's, it's an endocannabinoid. So we know that anandamide is produced in any persistence hunting um, genetics. So humans produce anandamide when they exercise. It's believed that anandamide is what triggers the exercise euphoria. We know there's a buildup. We know dogs build up anandamide when they are running and doing things. So there's, there, you have to have a reason for your body to say, hey, this is pretty hard, but you got to get a reward on that. So even though you get the dopamines and the serotonins and those kind of things, something has to trigger these, okay? So anandamide looks like it's that hormone that it's, it's the endocannabinoid that does that. Now, we can take this a couple other levels. Anandamide is also a really powerful retrograde communication tool at the nervous level. So when you have a nerve that wants to communicate to another nerve, it does it at what's called a synapse. And so the nerve, you finally build up enough of a signal that the nerve wants to communicate and it dumps whatever the transmitter is. Well, what anandamide then does to, it's what's called a retrograde modulator. So when that, um, when that transmitter goes from one side of the synapse to the other, anandamide communicates back upstream to say, hey, this is, let's say it's acetylcholine. 
There's a lot of acetylcholine here. We've bound up. You can stop dumping right now. Now, in the absence of anandamide you, or those low cannabin, the endocannabinoid levels, you have a low retrograde response at that synapse level. Which, and when you start to take a look at adrenal fatigue and a lot of these nervous conditions that we're dealing with with overtraining, it looks like this could be a very well described by the role of endocannabinoids in your system. And the other thing that we know is that when you consume exogenous cannabinoids, cannabinoids from outside your body, it looks like it boosts anandamide is produced on demand. It's not like there's a gland that kind of you know pumps it out. It's it's a uh, it's it's produced on demand, but when you consume exogenous cannabinoids, it increases the synthesis of your endocannabinoids, anandamide 2AG, some of these other ones, but it also reduces the oxidation of the active uh, of the active chemical. So you, it's it's you know we we we've all heard of serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. Well, the consumption of exogenous cannabinoids gives you the ability to hold on to your endocannabinoids longer, so you have an improved performance at that neural level. Which, when we start taking a look at recovery, I, I've got to tell you, I'm going to do some more. Work. I'll continue to work on this, but I think HRV is one of the closest analogs to measuring um, anandamide levels or endocannabinoid levels as you are. This, so the same way in your, in your car, you've got a gauge in your car that says E on one side and F on the other, and it goes down as you drive. Well, it's measuring the amount of gasoline in a tank. Okay, so when we look at H, when we look at heart rate variability, it looks like that could really be one of the measurements of the anandamide levels in the body. And I know you talked extensively when we interviewed you the first time about HRV and using it to monitor training loads. We didn't get into the recovery with the athletes that you've worked with. How many of them? Have diff- did you find had difficulties recovery, recovering? I know you were working mostly with college athletes and anybody who's lived in a college dorm with the noise, mm-hmm. the lights, if your roommate actually happens to be a student studying, I would imagine that can increase the sympathetic activity and decrease the quality of sleep, which can have, have a problem for recovery. Yeah, well, and, and I'll take it one step farther is that um, – I had, you know, of the 10, so we qualified 10 guys for nationals last year. It's the first time we ever did it. To make All-American or not make All-American is a very, very fine line. Um, and, and we were talking earlier about the role of an applied scientist that, you know, there's a lot of times, you know, my research is not, it's not placebo controlled and it's not double blind. You know, I'm throwing the kitchen sink at kids trying to get a response. But when we look at trauma, and, I, and so I'm going to take, I'm going to go down this trauma rabbit hole just a little bit. One of, one of the other things that we see in studies with anandamide is that in your brain, you have a part of your brain that's called the amygdala. And the amygdala is the fear sensing part of your brain. So when you have someone who has been traumatized, when you have someone who has been sexual trauma or family trauma or, or whatever, one of the things what we see in mice is there's a drop in anandamide in the amygdala. This looks like it's one of the evolutionary response. So if you're born into a snake pit, if you're born into a rattlesnake pit, you have to be hyper observant. So anyone who has had to come through a traumatic event, if someone's been sexually abused, um, the way they get through this is they have to see everybody as a possible abuser. Okay, because they've probably been sexually abused by a family member. And once you've had that violation, you know, it's all downhill from there. So the way they survive this is that it looks like there is an ad- an adaption of amygdala based anandamide. Well, there's a couple pretty cool studies out there where they took mice and they enhanced anandamide levels in the brain and they were able to alleviate the fear they were able to create a fear extinction based on anandamide levels in the amygdala. So when you have an athlete who has been traumatized, if you go back to the, the example we gave earlier, remember we drew a line and we put a box of stress on top of the line. Well, if you drew a diagonal line from the right-hand corner of that box down, I call that the angle of recovery. 
Um, so the question is, the size of the box will change the angle of recovery. Well, the individual's trauma or trauma profile will change the angle of recovery too. If I have someone who has had to deal with family trauma versus someone who did not have to deal with tra- family trauma, the person who has not had to deal with family trauma recovers better than the one that did. Okay, so not the same way we have a variation in in genetics based on where the tomato plant is planted in the row. I can have a variation in genetics based on the kids who come into my team based on their, you know, their environmental impacts. And it's significant. So, you know, this is this has been one of the really interesting parts. When you take a look at at post-traumatic stress, when you take a look at anxiety, when you take a look at a lot of these neural challenges that people have. Well, there's a reason why they smoke pot, okay? A lot of these people are just trying to normalize their anandamide levels in their amygdala. You know, and based on some work that we did, you know, based on some conversations that I had working with special operations groups and and some work that we did with the Air Force Research Lab, it looks like once someone has been traumatized, that's their normal state. Okay? And and that makes sense. You know, once you've gone through it, you go you become hypervigilant. So the question is, is how do you moderate and mediate this hypervigilant state? Well, this is where exogenous cannabinoids can be very, very beneficial. And I'm curious, I mean, obviously, the, tra- the various types of traumas, could this also be included <clears throat> as far as if they had, if, if somebody outside of college had a difficult job, as far as a boss was constantly yelling at them, uh, or a situation where the job was very, very high stress with long hours, lots of travel, would that also have an effect on reducing recovery if they were trying to be a good athletic performer, say in a marathon? Absolutely. Stress is stress. And, and, um, you know, I work with, I'm working with a guy out in in Nevada right now that's a climber and he's in real estate. Um, And he's a very talented climber, but but we're talking about his HRV measurements and so forth. And we're talking about his stress. And I'm like, dude, you do real estate in freaking Las Vegas. (laughs) Um, you know, that's a high stress event. Um, and so, so to answer your question, yes, stress is stress. We all have it. The question is, is how are you responding to it? And part of the challenge is, is that, you know, it was easy when we were hunter gatherers on the plane because the lion got you or it didn't. And this is the reason we remember fearful events because when the, when you get away from the lion, your brain says, you know what, maybe you shouldn't go back there anymore. You know, if you come across a pack of bunnies, um, your brain's not going to say, hey, you know, this is a really special place because the bunnies aren't going to hurt you. Um, but when you come across the lion's den, the brain encodes that. Um, and again, when you take a look at that stress encoding, it looks like whether you're in this, and again, the chronic state, we deal with a lot of paper tigers. Now I have a very good friend, his name's Dr. Ron Garbo, who does a lot of work with pain management. And he talks about the role of the amygdala and he talks about tigers versus paper tigers. Um, we have a lot of paper tigers. Um, so your ability to, you know, he also uses this great saying, he says, he says, fear, he says, stress comes from either regret of the past or fear of the future. He says, when you stay present, when you stay present in what you're doing, there is no fear there. And this is one of the values of being in flow and being present and, and doing this kind of work. That's your prefrontal cortex kind of kicking in and saying, okay, amygdala, you know, I use this term with my wife a lot. She, she would come home from school upset from an interaction with a supervisor. And I'd say to her, so was this supervisor a, a, a rattlesnake or a garter snake? Um, she saw a snake and she had a, she had a fear reaction, but at some point in time, you know, the prefrontal cortex kicks in and says, "Mm, let me evaluate this. Now, someone who has been traumatized dramatically, that's a really hard thing to do. Okay. It's really hard for that prefrontal cortex to kick in because trauma sucks. Um, and the, you know, if someone, you know, if you've lost a child or if you've been sexually abused or if you're, you're, you're physically abused. You know, you have this adjustment. It's really, really hard to do. Um, But this is where maybe treatment on a daily basis, looking at cannabis as a vitamin and not as a drug can be, could be, I, I think there's something here. 
And I know that there are some people who are going to be unable to do that either because of the state that they live in or possibly with their job. What are some other ways that people can recover? I know the easy thing people say, well, well, just sleep more. Well, if you have all of these no. things going on, you're not going to be able to sleep. And I know you did some things with your wrestlers and you've probably got some insights for people who, whether or not they're trying to win a, a big 10 championship or an NCAA, or maybe they're just, their goal is to break three hours in a marathon and they've got this high stress job and, you know, a husband who's always on their back and three kids who have five different sports. Yeah, it, it's um, exercise can be recovery. Okay. Uh, exercising in zone four and five probably aren't. Um, once you start to go glycolytic, you know, the production of, 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 of um, lactic acid is going to bring with it a lactate process and your body's going to see that as, you know, as, as a stress, it's going to produce cortisol. But if you do a good job of building base, going out for a walk and being in zone two or three can be a very good recovery process. Because not only are you uh, mobilizing a lot of these non-stress producing hormones, um, you're also building base. So you're building capacity to do work later on. Um, it begins with an awareness. Um, you and I were talking before the, the podcast began. Uh, this guy I work with in Nevada, um, you know what? He was listening to one of my podcasts, so he started to look at his HRV, and his was pretty low. Um, so he's just developing awareness. So we're talking about different tools that he can use. In fact, we're getting ready to do a study with him that uh, we're going to do a couple day study using HRV, but then we're going to have him eliminate alcohol for a week. Okay. Alcohol is a recovery thief. Okay. There, there is no value in the, cons in the consumption of alcohol. Alcohol is a neuro, um, is a neurotoxin. Um, alcohol steals sleep. Um, and so, so we're going to do a study. Listen, this guy drinks. He's a real estate guy. He lives in Vegas. Alcohol is part of that. Um, but you, but it's ultimately a decision. Do I walk past the lion's den or do I walk around it? Um, do I, if I'm going to consume, what am I also going to do to enhance what's going on? You know, THC can also be an anxiety creating. Too much THC can create anxiety and it can be a recovery thief. Doesn't look like CBD is. Um, but, um, but understand, you know, starting to pay attention to what the, you know, what your gas tank says um, gives you an idea of what your, you know, this gives you an idea of what your behaviors are, are delivering. So, you know, one of the big recovery tools for us at Ohio State was sensory deprivation floating. Um, putting guys in float tanks move the needle. Uh, the SEALs use it. Everyone who does elite per human performance loves to float. Um, it really moves. Now, whether it's magnesium, whether it is the intense meditative environment, you know, there's several things. They're doing some interesting research in Dr. Uh, Bill Kramer's lab at Ohio State. They're starting to try and tease this out. But we, we definitely know that floating boosts parasympathetic response in HRV. Um, it looks to me like the, the, the consumption of exogenous cannabinoids particularly those that are not stress producing. Again, staying away from the high THCs. Again, a high THC event is going to create a, a sympathetic response. Um, you may feel stoned, but your central nervous system is working. You may feel drunk. You may think you're going to sleep, but your central nervous system is metabolizing that alcohol and it's not providing recovery. Um, How much for the, I'm thinking all these things that you're saying that, uh, it seems like many of the outstanding endurance athletes and other athletes move to mountain towns, obviously for the benefits of elevation. But I'm also thinking, uh, you know, every time I'm about 20 miles from Pittsburgh, every time I go into Pittsburgh, it's much noisier, it's louder. There's all kinds of external stimuli. Yeah. How much does the uh, exercise you were mentioning, low intensity exercise, is there anything in your experience where it's better to go out and say, walk or jog in the woods versus jogging down a, a busy street? Well, when you look at recovery, you, you see this term coming up called earthing. Mm -hmm. um, going into the woods, I mean, in Eastern cultures, this is a big deal. And there's no doubt, you know, I just, I finished another really interesting book, Bill Poland's book, Changing Your Mind. And you take a look at 
at perspective and the ability of perspective to eliminate the role of the ego. You know, when the ego is in good control, that's usually a pretty sympathetic place to be. Um, when you're able to to get away from the ego and be connected to the collective or to the greater, you know, that's usually a better place to be. But there is no doubt that sitting on the side of a mountain, taking in God's, you know, beauty is a, is a recovery event. Um, another really good book, um, it's called uh, the, I think it's called the blue ocean. It's the benefit of being in on or around the water. Um, you know, listen, there, one of the, when I moved to Florida, I said, if I'm going to live in Florida, I'm going to live next to the water. And I've been able to do that. And when I'm able to wake up in the morning and go out and sit and watch the sunrise, um, and just listen to the ocean and focus on being present, there's no doubt that that is a, a benefit. Now, let me, I'm going to take you down another little rabbit hole here. I'm curious. Um, I'm curious with that before you go down the rabbit hole. Okay. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm an outdoor in the woods exerciser. That's my happy place. I've never had a, whenever I've been stressed, there's never been anything that's looked worse after doing that, even if it's just going and sitting in the woods. But I'm curious, and I, I, you may not be able to answer this. I've thought about this over the last couple of months. I'm wondering how much the growth of yoga studios in cities are because people always have all these external stimuli around them and they're looking for that quiet place that you get by going and sitting by the ocean or I get by going and sitting or walking in the woods. Well, listen, yoga comes from the Sanskrit to yoke, the mind to the body. So when you're doing yoga, when yoga is being done well, taught well, it is, it is a physical meditative environment. You're focusing on Pres- being present at that time. That's the, and again, using breath work and those tools. I mean, good yoga is a, is a hyper meditative environment. And that's, that's the rabbit hole we won't go down, which is good yoga. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not going down that one, but um, <laughs> there, there's, there's good strength coaches and there's, yes, there's a lot of bad ones. Um, but um, yeah, so yoga me- comes from the Sanskrit to yoke. So it is about that meditative space. You know, I have, a, I have two brothers that are fishing nuts. Okay. They, and you know what? I didn't understand it until I started to look at this. And I think about standing in a stream uh, up in the, the Rockies, up in Wyoming or somewhere and throwing that line repetitively in and out. That is a very, I'm like, okay, I get it. Or hunting, you know, going into the woods and being quiet and paying attention to your breath and being aware of everything around you and not thinking of yourself. Um, that is being connected to the collective. That is trying to push down the ego. Um, so listen, I, I love, you know, I, I, I do a presentation where I talk about, um, the environment impact on our genetics. So if you, um, I put up, uh, uh, pictures of orcas. Um, one orca is in sea world and the other orca is out in the ocean. And when you look at these two pictures, if you search this, what you'll see is that the orcas that are kept in an aquarium, their dorsal fin rolls over. It doesn't stay up straight. But when you see orcas in the wild, those, those dorsal fins are dead straight. So what we know is for orcas, when we keep them in an aquarium, there's not an enough of an environmental force for them to express their genetics to have their dorsal fins stand up straight. And then if we take a look at other animals in the old zoos, that you had these old zoos where animals were kept in these small cages with the bars in front. And those animals, the average lifespan was less than three years. And they had digestive problems and they had anxiety and they had all these. Whereas when we move these animals to these enriched environments that we have in zoos now, well, they reproduce. There's a lot of good. And so I think a lot of times humans, we've, we've gone from our, our natural wild environment to our aquariums. We go from our house aquarium to our car aquarium to our work aquarium, and we're not expressing our DNA. Um, so exercise helps with that. But at some point in time, you've got to be able to get your mind, you've got to get your eyes into a place where they're cast out across something that's not the front of an aquarium. Um, and again, it looks like the thing that is adjusting here could very well be anandamide. It's, um, it sounds like one of the things that's important for recovery is finding some activity or place where you can be present. Oh, yeah. Presence, listen, pre- presence is just good life. 
Yeah. Um, and, and what and what's right for you may not be right for me. So it's difficult to basically say this is what everybody needs to do for recovery. So that's one thing. The the flotation tanks, the the use of cannabinoids. Any other tips for people who are maybe out there and they're listening and they're thinking, you know, I know my life is stressed. I'm still going to be active. I'm still going to be try to be competitive, but I don't know what to do because I'm clearly not recovering. Well, I, I think one of the first things you do is you start to establish some kind of a dashboard. Um, you start to figure out what impact are these things having on me. And again, HRV is a good way to do this. Or, you know, again, I go back to my friend, Ron, Dr. Ron Garbo. He calls it intentional recovery. You know what? If you live in a cabin in the woods, you may be able to forget about recovery. But when you live in an inner city aquarium, you may have to focus on this it, it may be it may be the key element, um, and so again, if you're a realtor in Las Vegas, yeah, going and climbing is good, but you've got to pay attention to these other. You know, what are the other lions dens that you're having to deal with? Um, and then we take this again to the next level. You know, this is one of the things that really aggravated me about the last Supreme Court uh, nomination that took place is that regardless of whether you think this guy was a good jurist. Someone from his past came through and said, you know what, I was treated inappropriately. And when you understand the impact, it's, it's not child's play anymore. That when you decide to impose yourself on another human, when a male takes the point and imposes themselves on a female, it changes their wiring. It changes them for life because this is that the, 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 the young lady expressed the fact that she feared for her life. Okay. I am not, it's not my job to judge whether she's telling the truth or not. It's my job to help people understand what impact we're having on others and what they can do, you know, to alleviate the suffering of others and contribute to the, to the well-being of the healthy. Um, and this is, it, it is not a simple linear relationship. Um, there are a lot of points that are interacting at a lot of different levels. Um, I consider myself blessed for having, you know, listen, I, I believe the universe puts you in a place for a reason. I think it, it moved me out of Ohio state. It put me there for a reason. I learned a lot, got to help a bunch of kids. Um, but I think it moved me out of there for a reason because I'm supposed to be helping people at, a, at another way. And so, so, you know, looking at cannabis, you know, we didn't even talk about cannabis's role as an anti-inflammatory. I mean, it's a it's a powerful inset um, that works at a lot of different levels. So you take a look at it as an inset. You take a look at it as a neuromodulator. You take a look at it as a stress mitigator, a, a, a hormone that you can use to improve the the resiliency. Um, you know, I I consider myself blessed for having the opportunity to do this. We've been talking to Don Moxley. He is an applied sports scientist. I think he's given us some great information about cannabis, its potential uses, and the fact that we probably have not touched upon all the uses or the research that we'll see on it. He's given me some food for thought. I told him before we started recording, he's dropped me down the rabbit hole of really getting into measuring my HRV and looking at how what I eat in a day affects my HRV the next day. Uh, I was told them the story, a heavy drinking night for me was four beers and it really put my HRV in the tank the next day. What I like about moving to live is being able to interview people like Don and giving you information that you can think about. Don, I want to thank you again for talking to me. This was probably a little longer than I was expecting, but I honestly think I could probably talk to you for another four or five hours because it's, it's fascinating for me. And so I appreciate you talking to me. Oh, no problem. And the three people that would still be listening at that point, you know. <laughs> thanks for listening to the latest episode of moving to live make sure you check out the show notes for contact information for our latest guest as well as links about all the things we talked about intro and exit music is traveling light by jason shaw you can subscribe to moving to live on stitcher apple podcasts and google play and be notified about new episode releases have any questions, comments, or suggestions, drop us an email, mov2liv at gmail.com. Connect with us on Twitter or Instagram, both underscore mov2liv. Please tell your friends about moving to live. 
It's a go-to place for information for movement and exercise professionals and amateur aficionados who understand that movement is part of what makes your life complete. Until next week, keep on moving.